Welcome to Stars Matter, a recruiting podcast from The Athletic. I'm Mitch Light, joined by Ari Wasserman. And Ari, today with a very special guest, Austin Meek, covers the University of Michigan for us at The Athletic. We have talked a lot about Michigan football on this podcast, about its recruiting, lack thereof, why they aren't recruiting better. So now we're going to bring Austin in. He's going to answer every question. We're going to solve every Michigan recruiting question. Austin, first of all, welcome to the podcast. This is... Uh, You'll look back. This will be the defining moment in your career. I'm very confident. I think this is the highlight to this point, yeah, of, of my uh, four years at The Athletic. It's a real real uh, honor to be on the show with you guys. <laughs> well, good. So, Ari, would you like to, to, to welcome your, your Mitch, former Midwestern colleague? Mid, uh, Mitch said, well, maybe we could have Austin on for a segment that we could talk about. I said, if we have Austin on, it's the whole show. You know, like this is... <laughs> This guy is this guy's big time and his beats big time. So I'm and there, happy hey, to hear there's Austin. always uh, there's always stuff to talk about with Michigan recruiting. We can get the uh, we can get the couch out here and just uh, settle in for the long haul. Yeah. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna take a, a deep dive into the Wolverines recruiting, which Ari we talk about. Ari writes a lot about. Hasn't been great in recent years, but obviously the team's been very good. We're gonna talk a little bit Ohio State recruiting in its pursuit of offensive linemen. Clemson picked up a running back commitment on Wednesday. We'll have trivia, and we might dip into the mailbag. I don't know if Austin knew this, but as a guest, you will be subjected to trivia. And I've done my research, Austin. Not only do we have Michigan trivia, we have trivia about your alma mater as well. So I've done my research. Okay. Well, I, if it's uh, if it's Kansas State trivia circa like 1998, it's right in my wheelhouse. So oh, okay. We'll see what you got. <laughs> it, it, so um, Ari, you want to dive in first? You're you're, you're Mister uh, Big Ten. Well, how about this? Let's just uh, start up with a layup here, Austin. Like, what's your general assessment of the way that Michigan's recruited the last few years? Up and down, um, not at the level that you would expect for a program that has accomplished what Michigan has accomplished on the field the last few years. Um, probably not at the level that you would hope for from a program just with Michigan's stature in college football. I think in general, Michigan has done a, a pretty solid job of evaluating and, and developing players. You know, you could go through the list of players like, you know, Quiddy Pay or Ronnie Bell, who were three-star recruits and not, not big names that turned into good players at Michigan. Um, but you could also go through the list and say, like, a program at, at Michigan's level, and, and Ari, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with this, you know, ought to be bringing in more top 100 players, more five-star players. Michigan has had some, the ones they've gotten, you know, some of them like JJ McCarthy have, have panned out the way you would hope. Some of them haven't. That's the nature of football recruiting. But you know, overall, I think Michigan has been, has been solid in that area, but not up to the potential of the program. Let me back up a little bit with some numbers here. Um, six, Michigan had six top 10 classes from 2012 through 2020. So six out of nine years is a top 10 class. Um, that's 66 percent, Mitch. Did yeah, you know that? I I did. Thank you, Ari. Uh, the number nine <laughs> class in 22, and the number 18 class in 23. The, the the alarming part of the 23 class were the no top 100 players. Only one top 150 player. Um, as recently as 2017, six top 100 players, 11 top 150 players. Um, now. Anyone listening, and this is a very fair point of Michigan fans that, well, let's look at the success on the field. It's been good the last two years, and that's really what matters, and we all agree that is what matters there. Um, so, uh, Austin, my, my question would be, what do you attribute this to lack of staff continuity in the past few years? You know, I, I think that's probably part of it. Michigan has, has had a lot of staff turnover. There are some programs – that have a lot of staff turnover and keep humming right along. I mean, look at Al Alabama, sure. the coaches that have come and gone under Nick Saban, and they sign the number one or number two class every year. So um, I think that that's part of it, uh, but probably not all of it. Um, you know, the, I mean, just looking back to when Jim Harbaugh um, over, overhauled his staff a couple of years ago, you know, they had a lot of kind of long tenured assistant coaches, Don Brown, the defensive coordinator, and they, they really remade their staff. They, they brought in some younger coaches, some coaches who had a reputation for being uh, more, more aggressive in recruiting. And I think that that has paid some dividends. I think that was a necessary change that they made. Um, but I also think it's totally fair to say, like, even after doing that, l l look at their 2023 class and it, it wasn't great. So 
Um, I think there's a lot of different factors going on there, and that's one piece of it. I think they have had a lot of turnover on their staff. Dante Moore, all right, I'll let you chime in just a second, but you got Dante Moore in the 23 class going to, I was going to say Oregon, but UCLA, and mm-hmm. then J.J. Carr, um, obviously everyone knows his story, going, appears in Notre Dame. How much, not asking you to speak for the entire fit, well, I am asking you to speak for like, because because you're there. How much of an issue is this? Or are Michigan fans like, you know what, we're living in the moment, we've got a five-star quarterback, we've made the playoff two times in a row, we'll deal with that later. I mean, I think Michigan fans are pretty plugged into the fact that you always have to be thinking about who's next. It's it's not just about like, hey, we're going to enjoy this run and worry about tomorrow when it comes. It's like Michigan fans want to use this run to set up something that's going to sustain it into the future. And a big part of that is figuring out who's going to be the quarterback after J.J. McCarthy. And they went all in with Dante Moore in the 2023 class. Um Probably, you know, to the exclusion of going all in with CJ Carr and CJ Carr is going to Notre Dame as of now and Dante Moore is going to UCLA and and Michigan is still looking for that guy and and maybe it's Jaden Davis. He's been the the name that everybody has talked about here for a long time in the 2024 class. But um, I, I do think that there is a sense among the Michigan fan base that they have an opportunity here to really build on this run and turn it into something sustainable. But that's going to mean being able to, you know, bring in talent at the level that you need to win a national championship. And and as good as Michigan has been the last couple of years, it doesn't feel like they've quite gotten there yet. You know, uh, it's funny because that's the whole deal. Like back when I was on the beat and you and I overlapped for that year, the Ohio State beat, we always discussed like what has to come first, like the chicken or the egg, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have to beat Ohio State to get the players or do you have to get the players to beat Ohio State? And it turned out that they were able to beat Ohio state without the players. Uh, you know, they had great players, but without recruiting at that, at that level we're speaking of, mm-hmm. but I always assumed that after that happened, that the recruiting would, would catch up. So let me ask you this. Are you surprised by this? And also, you know, Mitch asked about staff continuity, but how much of it is just Jim Harbaugh's uh, flirtation with the NFL and, you know, maybe just not, quite being both feet down, it seems. Yeah, I mean, among the factors, I think that that's definitely one to talk about is the fact that, especially for the 2023 class, you know, that first, that month of January last year after last season, that whole month was basically just total uncertainty about what Jim Harbaugh was going to do. And that's a, you know, a pretty important time when you're building your recruiting class. And I do think that that contributed to a slow start for Michigan in, in the 23 class. And You know, the 24 class is off to a faster start. It it seems like that may not be as big of an issue this time around, but it's still, you know, it's still something out there. And Jim Harbaugh is not, you know, not really backing away from it. You know, we talked to him last week for the first time since the season ended. And he basically said like, Hey, this is an ongoing thing. Like if, if an opportunity comes up, I'm going to at least explore it if it seems like a good fit. And that's, that's hardly a, uh, you know, definitive statement that he's not going anywhere. And so I, I do think that, um, you know, I do think that's played into it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not super surprised. I think Michigan, you know, has a way that they want to do things. And it's, you know, you, it's definitely open to critique and, you know, uh, uh, open to criticism, especially, you know, when, when they aren't signing classes at the level that, um, that they're used to signing. But, you know, I, I think from their perspective, they'd probably say like, hey, we have a you know, we have a way we do things and it has worked out for us. And, you know, people can say there's not enough five stars, not enough top 100 players, but um, we've done a pretty good job with with what we have. I, I, you know, I think there's more to it than that, but that's probably the perspective that you would hear from them. And I think they would also say we've established ourselves as a de- destination, not just for transfer portal guys, elite transfer portal guys, you know, once you, you've done it for two straight years or two straight cycles, I think it becomes cool. Like that's the place. If I'm going to transfer, I'm an elite player. I can go to Michigan and, and plug right in. And if you would have asked me Austin a couple of years ago too, I don't know why, like name some schools that will be de- destinations for the top transfers. I would not have said Michigan. No. I just d- didn't seem like that's part of their MO, their culture, all that stuff, but it's working and we can't, sit here and talk about recruiting and not mention how well they've done with the high-end transfers. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the big development at Michigan over the last two years, because you're right, it, 
early on in the transfer portal era, Michigan was not a big player for transfers. And there was a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, Michigan's admissions requirements are too high. You know, they, they have to take grad transfers. They can't take undergrad transfers because it's hard to get in. There's a lot of discussion about that at Michigan. And then they just signed you know, seven guys, a mix of grad transfers and undergrads uh, who are expected to come in and play a, a pretty big role on this team. So the, the portal has become a much bigger part of the strategy for Michigan the last couple of years. I think part of that is they saw how it could work with a guy like Olu Oluwatimi, who came in from Virginia, became the starting center, like just stepped in there from day one and filled a major need on that team that helped them get back to the playoff. And I think seeing how that can work probably opened up the doors a little more for Michigan to be more aggressive in the portal. And also part of this, I mean, you know, we've gotten this far without talking about NIL, but you know, that's something I've been told by people who are involved with NIL at Michigan is that if you're not going to go out there and throw money at, at recruits, high school recruits, the portal can be a really good strategy because the guys coming from the portal are established players who know that they're going to come in and play and know that if they come in and play, they're going to have good NIL opportunities. And that may be a strategy for Michigan going forward based on how they want to approach NIL. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a very complex scenario because, you know, the discussion point about Michigan was always figuring out a way to beat your rival and to win the Big Ten, right? Mm -hmm. And now that they've done that two consecutive years, and frankly speaking, should probably be favored next year because they're bringing back all, you know, a large portion of their team and they got, what, five really important transfers that can come in. Mm -hmm. Does the, does the, discussion ever have to shift to okay well now we have to build a team that can win a playoff game you know like what what is the next step because you said earlier on and i believe it to be, be to be true that michigan fans want to use the success that they've had the last two years as a springboard like i don't know what my if, if i'm 100 percent sure on this but like i don't think that you can win a playoff game through the portal um what's your take on that and do you think that at some point, Michigan's just going to have to figure out how to get it done in high school recruiting. Well, I think that the, the big question about Michigan's strategy is they have really made a big emphasis on NIL for established players. And that hit at a really good time because the class before NIL that Michigan signed had J.J. McCarthy and Donovan Edwards in it, and they had Blake Corum. So Michigan already had those really good high school players on their team and they've been able to build around those players. So if you've got, you know, five-star quarterback, JJ McCarthy, five-star running back, Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum, you know, one of the best skilled players in the country, can you build a team that can win a playoff game by surrounding them with players out of the portal? Yeah, I think you, I think you can. My question with Michigan, and I think the question that a lot of people have is, okay, what happens when J.J. McCarthy goes to the NFL and Donovan Edwards goes to the NFL? And if you haven't signed players of that caliber out of high school, um, because now we're in a different era, then mm -hmm. I don't think you can replace those guys through the portal. You have to be able to replace those guys organically, and then you can build around them through the portal. All right, go ahead. Got another one? Yeah, well, the thing that I that I think is interesting is like NIL is a real point. And like, I truly believe the idea that Michigan is not participating in the inducement space, right? Cause like Michigan has always been one step behind when it comes to really going all in financially, whether yeah. it be against the rules or, or, or in the rules. Yeah. But the question that I have for you really is like Jim Harbaugh is an odd person, right? Like he's just, <laughs> he's a different type of cat and yeah. I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm just saying he's a different dude. Can he ever just be an elite level recruiter or is he always going to need help? Like, like in your, in your, we well, did sign experience. multiple top 10 classes. All right. Do is that, is yeah. that elite enough for you? No, I'm saying like, I'm saying like a elite level class with eight to 11 top 100 players in it that could stack up to the next level in the progression of their program. And by doing so, being the lead recruiter, like, does he have that in him or does he need certain? key staff members to kind of run the show when it comes to in-home visits and uh, you know, all the things that, you know, come with face-to-face -face interaction with these guys. I think he's pretty dependent on the people around him. I think there are certain, certain players who connect with Jim Harbaugh 
Uh, and there's other players who don't. Like if you either you fit with Jim Harbaugh or you, or you don't. <laughs> Do um, you fit with Jim Harbaugh? <laughs> uh, I'll plead the fifth on that one. Okay. Uh, no, I, you know, uh, in my job, I think we, we do fine. If okay. I was playing for Jim Harbaugh, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah. So it's just, you know, I think the pool of players gets a little smaller when you're talking about who fits at Michigan. I think, right. you know, it's a really kind of specific type of player who is going to mesh with Jim Harbaugh and is going to mesh with, with Michigan. Um, and that just, you know, that takes some players off the board um, who might, you know, be on the board for some other programs and so I do think Jim Harbaugh is pretty dependent on on his staff. He he needs when Jim Harbaugh's had good people around him, a good staff around him. He's been really good. Um, at the times when the staff around him hasn't been as good, Michigan hasn't been as good. So I don't think Jim Harbaugh's never going to be Kirby Smart. He's never going to be Nick Saban. He's never going to be you know the guy who just walks in the living room and knocks it out of the park with with any player you know he's recruiting. It's kind of a specific fit with him. And if it's not a fit with him, then maybe there's somebody else on the staff who can build that relationship and get that player to Michigan. But I, I don't think it's ever going to be, you know, Jim Harbaugh is going to be like the driving force behind Michigan, you know, recruiting at the level of Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, awesome. Chime in if you've got a story along this line, too. But one thing that, that I've noticed that, that from stories we've done is that Jim Harbaugh appears to be very popular with some high school coaches. Like, I don't know if you guys remember mm. Audrey Snyder and Grace Rayner did that story about like what happens when kind of rock star coaches come to high schools. Mm -hmm. And there's one coach in there who had a great story about Harbaugh coming in and staying for like three hours watching film and almost overstaying his welcome. He's just a, it seems like when he gets in that environment, he's just a regular guy who likes to talk ball. He's not necessarily this I, I, I don't know if you use the word weirdo, but he's not this weirdo that we, we seem to see from the outside. Yeah, I think that was Tim Racky, who was uh, J.J. McCarthy's yes. coach at Nazareth Academy. Uh, and yeah, I, you know, I think that there is something to the fact that when you actually spend time with Jim, Jim Harbaugh, he's not the person that you always see on Twitter or on TV or whatever. Um, that's not to say he's not like a very unique personality that's you know probably different than any other coach that these players are going to come across, but, but there is an aspect to him where he's just like a, a dude who likes football and likes talking about football is really intense, really competitive. And I do think that that translates better probably in that setting than, than you realize if you just like watch his press conferences. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that there's certainly something to the fact that like when Jim Harbaugh goes into a school, he's a, he is a rock star. Like, People know who he is, like the opportunity to play for Jim Harbaugh. I, I still think that that carries something. Um, I just don't think that it, you know, that alone is going to be enough to get Michigan maybe all the way to where they want to be. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about just in general, what you would improve if like you were the czar of Michigan football, like mm -hmm. what areas do you think you would want to shore up based on your reporting and stuff like that might be a tough question, but like, where do you think they're lacking and, and what do you think they could do better? You know, I, you talk about what we just said about like, there's some players that you look at and say, that guy just may not be a fit at Michigan. Um, and I think there's a case to be made that like, if that guy is not a fit, maybe you make him a fit. Like, you know, the mm -hmm. schools that are really at the top, um, they're not like limiting themselves in any way. Like they just want as many really good players as they can get. And I, I mean, that's true of Michigan too. Like Michigan wants, a, Michigan wants good players. Like they're, you know, they have the same strategy, but sometimes it feels like Michigan goes a little bit too far toward like the kind of super selective, you know, we want Michigan men and, you know, we'd rather have like that, you know, under the radar guy who fits our culture rather than, you know, the, the five-star guy who doesn't fit at Michigan. It's like, there's a lot of five-star players who, you know, came into Michigan and uh, helped Michigan win a lot of games. You know, Dax Hill, uh, going back to him, like you need those players and not that Michigan's not trying to get them. Um, but sometimes I think maybe Michigan could, could, you know, assert themselves a little bit more and be like, Hey, we're, we're Michigan. Like we are, you know, we're on par with anybody in college football and we can, we should be able to go into any living room uh, and, ma and make a compelling pitch. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially looking at some of the recent classes where the, the top end talent 
just hasn't been there, then it, it feels like that's kind of the last thing that's missing. It's just a few more of those top 50, top 100, five-star type players. After the 2021 season, Courtney Morgan, I don't know what Courtney Morgan's title was at Michigan recruiting staff, you know, heading the recruiting efforts, mi- played at Michigan, left Michigan to go uh, join Kalen DeBoer's new staff at Washington as their head of player development uh, or their lead, lead, lead recruiting guy. Now he's a West Coast guy, so you could say that, but how was that move received by Michigan fans from the outside looking in? That seemed like not great, Michigan. You know, you lose one of your own. Was that was there a personality conflict there? It was definitely kind of a head scratcher because he had just gotten there. And he, like you said, he played at Michigan. Uh, there was a lot of fanfare when he came in. Like, okay, finally, like Michigan has Michigan somebody, <laughs> yeah, who's gonna, you know, really inject some life into Michigan recruiting. Um, you know, I mean, it's some of it's a little bit of revisionist history because, you know, the class before Courtney Morgan got there was a really good class. You know, the, the J.J. McCarthy, Donovan Edwards class was really good at the time that a lot of people still were kind of down on Michigan recruiting. Uh, it, you know, I think that I don't know the specifics exactly of Courtney Morgan's situation, but I do know that, um, you know, Jim Harbaugh's. As we said, the same thing that applies to players applies to anybody in the building. Some people really mesh with Jim Arbaugh and, and some people don't, and he's not the easiest guy to work for. And, um, you know, if, if somebody's going to come in and kind of change the way things are being done at Michigan, that's always subject to ultimately what Jim Harbaugh thinks is best. You know, he's the head coach. That's his, his right. Um, but, you know, whether it was like more freedom – you know, that Courtney Morgan would have had it at Washington or just the relationship with the head coach because they'd worked together before. I mean, it was, I think, a head scratcher for a lot of people at Michigan just because it seemed like uh, Courtney Morgan was sort of exactly what Michigan needed at that point in time. And then he ended up leaving like a year later. Is Michigan going to get Jaden Davis or? <laughs> I love um, asking unanswerable answer. questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, before before Michigan's uh, offensive coordinator got tied up in uh, various computer uh, issues, I I would have said yes. I still think probably yes, but I, I mean, back in the fall, like towards the end of the season, there was a definitely a sentiment at Michigan that that it was going to happen, and so you ask the question like, why hasn't it happened yet? And I haven't heard anything to suggest that, um, you know, a lot has changed other than, you know, Michigan's got a new quarterbacks coach now who I think needs to kind of build that relationship. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, I think, unfortunately for Michigan, like the longer these things have gone on, um, the, the more nervous you get because Michigan's had a few of these where they felt good about it and then it just went on and on and on and it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I would still say yes. I still think that it's, going to happen but i'm not as confident as i would have been like two months ago how big of a threat is michigan state to michigan in recruiting or is it a threat i think that michigan state under mel tucker has has definitely become a program that can go toe-to-toe with michigan for for kids in michigan uh, they've had a, a couple recruiting battles that that michigan state has has won um I think that, you know, Michigan is never going to be, you know, a, a, a program that relies, you know, strictly on in-state players. Michigan uh, is going to go to some other places. And, you know, they made the state of Michigan a bigger priority. Part of Courtney Morgan, when he got hired as part of the whole staff overhaul, was making the state of Michigan a bigger priority. And you saw some some dividends from that. Um, but you know, it's, it's competitive in the state of Michigan and Michigan state's part of that. Kentucky comes in and and does a good job in the state of Michigan. So I, you know, I I don't think that Michigan state is like an existential threat to Michigan where like Michigan's not going to be able to, you know, put together a, you know, a big 10 championship caliber roster because of Michigan state. But I do think it's become a, a program that, that Michigan does have to compete with. Um, and a program that can, you know, can get some kids out of the state of Michigan that, that Michigan wants. It's not just that Michigan State takes the players that Michigan doesn't want. I, I think it's, it's fairly competitive. Do you think that they are more equipped to go into Ohio than they had been in the past now? Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing that, 
that a lot of people talked about uh, at the time that Courtney Morgan came in and Michigan changed things around is that they'd really gotten away from the state of Ohio, which was historically a place that Michigan could go and get some really good players. And you know, I think hiring Steve Klinkscale on the staff has been probably the driving force in that. You know, he's from Youngstown, uh, recruited that area at Kentucky, came in, and I think has has opened some doors for Michigan in the state of Ohio. Um, you know, I, it's really one of the big criticisms of Michigan's recruiting strategy. You know, prior to the last couple of years was, you know, and, and Ari, I know you've talked about this. There's some really good players in Ohio who don't go to Ohio State because there's just not enough offers to go around and. If Michigan is able to go in and you know get that guy who is really good, but maybe just not quite above the line for Ohio State, uh, that could be a, a really effective way for Michigan to build its roster. And, and they have some of those guys. You know, Rod Moore um, was an Ohio kid, three-star player, not really recruited by Ohio State, comes into Michigan and is a starting safety as a freshman. Um, you know, it's... It's definitely like it's tricky because you don't want to go like too far down. And they've had they've had a couple guys from Ohio where it's like, is that a Michigan caliber player? Maybe so, maybe not. Uh, but it can be a you know a, an effective place for Michigan, and I think a way to uh, a way to build up kind of that middle of your roster with some really good players who who can turn into contributors. Yeah, wasn't the deal, guys? Both of you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Wasn't it the weekend of the Ohio State Michigan game where Michigan got a couple commitments from kids, Ohio kids who were visiting Ohio State, and people made a big deal mm-hmm. about it, but Ohio mm-hmm. State hadn't even offered them yet? Is that is that? Yeah, right? but like the thing is, is like when I was covering Ohio State, Michigan's presence in the state of Ohio was almost non-existent. You know, mm-hmm. and they did a really good job with Zach Harrison, and there was a, a minute there where it seemed like they were going to get him, and then after they didn't get him, it just kind of seemed like they're like, you know what, forget it, we're not, you know. And maybe that was just my perception, but high school coaches in the area would say we wish Michigan would come down more, mm-hmm. you know. And I mean, maybe, maybe part of that is you don't go into the state if you're not having a really good time in the rivalry. But Michigan had been successful in the rivalry for so many years previously because of that, that I was surprised that they got away from it. Now, the, the question that I have for you, Austin, and the thing that I've criticized Michigan for in the past is. Can you articulate what their strategy is? And maybe that's morphed a little bit now that there's NIL and the transfer portal and that stuff. But like when I would look at the way they would piece together classes, you know, one year they're in Massachusetts, the next year they're in California. And it's like, I didn't know what they were trying to do ever. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that really hurt them. You know, you talk about staff continuity. Maybe that's the reason why they couldn't formulate a plan, but like, what is the plan at Michigan geographically? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point. And it it goes back to what we were saying before about uh, Jim Harbaugh is probably not the head coach who is going to be like, the point person on a a recruiting juggernaut because a lot of Michigan strategy in the past was dictated by who was around Jim Harbaugh. It wasn't like a top down. This is Jim Harbaugh's plan and everybody's executing it. It was Don Brown is a new England guy who coached, you know, on the East coast. So they would go into, you know, Connecticut and Massachusetts and, and sign some guys and a lot of them, you know, worked out. Quinny Pay, Mike Sainer still, like they they got some good players out of that, even though it wasn't necessarily like a, a hotbed recruiting area. Um, but but it did kind of always feel like they were all over the map and their strategy, just depending on on where their assistant coaches were most comfortable. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you like a really super specific. Idaho, right? Blueprint. They, they're huge in Idaho. <laughs> the Idaho pipeline. Yeah, actually, Gatlin Bear, um, who is coached by Colston Loveland's high school coach, is a, a pretty highly recruited uh, 2024 prospect out of Idaho that Michigan is is recruiting. So, all I right, mean, get up, get over to Idaho. Let's <laughs> get boots on the ground. Let's get a story going. Yeah, no, it's just like the, I think that it is troublesome, you know. And it's like I. I have to be careful with how I say things sometimes because people no. think. <laughs> <laughs> like in this scenario, like, don't you think it is troublesome that the beat writer of Michigan, not because he's not smart or plugged <laughs> in or understanding, but the beat writer of Michigan can't articulate what their recruiting philosophy is like that is hard. And it's not because he doesn't know it's because there isn't one like that. I, and that's scary if I'm a Michigan fan. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is is the Michigan you know, culture of. 
we don't need to explain ourselves yeah. to you. Yeah. I mean, Ohio State, like, all right, man, I, I have to admit, I'm occasionally jealous uh, when <laughs> I see, you? like, the beat writers at yeah, don't Ohio be jealous State. Of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking well, to the recruiting you know, coordinator, like, you know, maybe yeah. if we'd had that at Michigan, like, maybe if, if we could sit down with the recruiting people, they would say, like, here's our strategy, here's what we want to yeah. do. And, and we could explain that to people, but that's, that's not how it is at Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing I will say, and it's ironic enough that I wrote a Q&A about Urban Meyer that ran on Wednesday, but say what you want about that, man. But if you asked him a pointed recruited recruiting question about strategy during my seven years on that beat, hey, why are you guys in Texas this year more? He would answer the question, not just to get through it, but like would give you a thorough, realistic example uh, an answer of why they were doing that. So it was very easy on the Ohio State beat to track the trends because you can, you know, look at what they're doing on 247, where are the offers going, where are the commitments coming from. Like you can do it yourself. Mm-hmm. But to have a coach that was able to walk you through it because he was so involved in that. Um, I remember one time on a conference call, I think this was like in 2016 or 17, I asked Jim Harbaugh on a call of a similar question. Like, <laughs> Hey, Jim, uh, you guys have signed X number of players out of Ohio in the last three years. And the three years before you arrived, it was three times as much. Can you explain to me how that happened and where Ohio fits in on your guys' recruiting uh, priority? And he goes, will you repeat the question? I don't understand that. (laughs) And then I repeated it again, clearer, like you guys are signing less players out of Ohio than you used to. Is there a reason for that? He goes, I don't know where you're going with this. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, I'm just curious what the response would be. He goes, yeah, uh, yeah. What, what the next question? <laughs> and like that, and like, and I've tried to interview Jim Harbaugh multiple times in forums like that about questions like that. And the man either can't comprehend what I'm asking <laughs> or is saying that he can't comprehend it in order not to answer it. And I found that to be quite frustrating. So I can't imagine, you know, I used to talk to Nick Baumgartner too. It's like, I feel like a lot of times on the Michigan beat and tell me if you think I'm wrong or, I mean, you're the one who's living it. But the beat writers are left to fill in the gaps at a lot of times, uh, whereas uh, in other places you can quote or have, you know, on the record discussions about certain things that you just can't have at Michigan. And that makes it challenging. Yeah, I think that's right. I I think my personal opinion about it is that Michigan could help itself by being just a little bit more open about like, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, these guys are smart, like the. The, Michigan has good coaches on its staff. Like they know what they're doing. It's just they don't really get that opportunity to um, to explain it very often. And so, yeah, it does kind of leave all of us to fill in the gaps a little bit. And like, you know, well, what was the strategy with the quarterbacks? You know, why 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 go all in with Dante Moore, not go all in with CJ Carr? Like, there's probably a really good answer to that. You know, or at least an answer that they could defend. Um, but that's just not really been how, how they operate their, their philosophy. And I think that this does come from the top down. It's just like, we have our way of doing things. We're confident in it. You can judge it on the field. If we're winning games, you know, it's working and you don't need to question it. (laughs) That's not how it works in college football, but that's, that's sometimes the approach. But that like is frustrating because that was the way it was when they weren't winning games. That's yeah. the way it was when they were losing to Ohio State every year. You know, mm-hmm. like now if you want to say, hey, you don't need to know the ingredients of the soup. The soup's good. You can see it on TV. It's like, okay, I can get that. Mm-hmm. But there were so many years where it was going the other direction where it's like, you know, we just have some insight what's on what's going on here. And, you know, the thing that is hard is like, yeah, the the access to it is a, is a lot different than it is in other places. But also, too, if you, t- you know, Mitch, you're the data guy, right? You know, you look at you know, where players are coming from and where they're going and stuff. Like if you look at Michigan's recruiting classes for the past seven years, there's no identifiable pattern. You can't even come up with a a theory on your own because it doesn't, it doesn't add up to anything. It's a sequence of random numbers. So like, to me, it's like every year they kind of sit down and they look at their draft, their, their recruiting board. They're like, okay, well, this guy's in Idaho. This guy's in Washington. This guy's in California. That one's in Texas. And there are a few of Michigan go. And it's just like the next year they're in five different States. And it's like, how can you build any sort of continuity or executable long-term plan if you're not following a plan, you know? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ari, because Manny Navarro, our colleague, covers Miami and recruiting, did an amazing amount of research for a story that he's working on that will run in a few weeks about where Power 5 signees come from. He looked at the last six signing classes. 
This is not our trivia question. What percent of Michigan's signees, and there's not much to compare it to because every state's different. I'm just curious if you guys know. What percent of Michigan's signees would you say uh, are in-state? What percent of Michigan's... Uh, signing. What's the time frame? I'm sorry. Last six recruiting classes. Last six recruiting. Twenty four percent. No, I, I, I was going <laughs> to say about twenty percent. Twenty percent. Yeah. Okay. Seventeen percent. So you guys are uh, close. Yeah. Um, twenty four was too close to a quarter. I'm I'm not very good at math. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's okay? What state do you think is second in the last five years? California. I I would guess I would guess California. Although there's probably a New England state that's higher on the list if it's massachusetts i'm hanging up and going (laughs) they are uh and i've I've, i'm making charts for all these so i've a lot of the numbers are kind of fresh for me they have a lot more balance after their home state than a lot Mm -hmm. um 14 from florida is next and then 10 from california 10 from illinois okay 11 from ohio seven from texas um so ohio is second most yes but but Yes, but by no Ohio's third most, Florida's second most at fourteen. Oh, Ohio's Florida, a, Florida, yeah. Uh, Massachusetts has six. They had that magical three year run of <laughs> it two, really really three, annoyed me in the last year's <laughs> class when Connecticut was it Connecticut that had two top one hundred players in it last year. Yeah, well, Massachusetts or Massachusetts, were, Massachusetts it had two. its best year. Like Samson Okanola, they Massachusetts yeah, had legitimately they got neither good year. of them. It's like after all of that. Right, and two top one players. John Brown get away. Yeah, yeah. Lost, like, what's going on here, man? Connections. Sweat equity to Massachusetts, <laughs> man. Come on, go close those guys. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is going to be. There's some really good numbers in here. Ari, we're going to have fun with, with with this, but um, yeah, I should have should have brought this up earlier. Let me see a little more. Other than Michigan, I'm trying to think if there's a state where they have signed at least one player in the last six classes. It does not. They they signed a California player in five straight classes. They signed a Florida player in five straight, but not last year's class. So just some, uh, yeah. Six. This is interesting, though, and we'll move on. They signed six players from Ohio in 2019. So they've signed 11 during the stretch, but six of them were five years ago. So they how many of those four- six had Ohio State offers? Yeah, well, we, we could look that up. So um, I bet you it's one or zero. Yeah, so... Um, is that the Eric All class? Eric All and a couple other players out of Ohio. Yeah, also Eric All is a baller. Yeah, I mean, that's the I drafted case. him. In, yeah. I, I drafted him in my Dynasty Football League, just so you guys know. That's good to know. I was wondering about I think that. he's a stud, yeah. Okay. Do you have his football card? I know you like to buy cards. No, but I've got Cade McNamara's card right here. <laughs> <laughs> you got you to get the Cade McNamara Iowa card. That's going to be the real. This one is, you got an auto on there. Oh, oh okay. Uh, I bought a bunch of college football cards over the over the weekend, and I'm sorting which ones I'm going to keep and which ones I'm going to get rid of. What do you What do you guys think about Aiden O'Connell? Should we hold on to that? Mm. Oh, that's a keeper. Long term, I think yeah. that's a keeper. Uh, well, Cade McNamara should get more love from the Michigan faithful man. He's the one who broke through the broke through the rivalry. <laughs> Tell me, he's about the guy. It, yeah. He's the yeah. guy behind the guy. I feel bad for the guy. Over mm. under total passing yards per game is set somewhere in between the seventy and seventy five, but <laughs> in his new position, but. Well, you yeah, know no, he's going mean, to lead Iowa to exactly 25.1 points per game. <laughs> yeah. We're going to start the on the Andy Staples show. We're going to have a total points countdown to like what it takes <laughs> to get there. Oh, that's it's good. It's like Utah State or something. They're going to score 77 points. But, you know, last year they couldn't have done it against anybody. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. But, All right, Ari, do you have any more? We, I want to move on. Some other things. Do you have any more wanna, brain busters? I want to. Uh, well, I've got two <laughs> trivia questions coming up. But th- this is sort of interesting because we've talked a lot about Ohio. And Ari, I don't know if you've paid attention to this and Austin chime in. Uh, Cameron uh, Teague Robinson, our Ohio State writer, wrote about these guys. Devante and Deontay Armstrong, two twins, mm-hmm. or not two twins, they're twins. I would get mad at Ari if he said two twins. <laughs> twins from Cleveland, St. Edward. Um, Deontay is ranked 300, is a true tackle. Devante is ranked 340 nationally. He's more of a guard swing guy. They, they both were offered recently. They grew up Ohio State fans. They were offered in January, so kind of late in the process. Now, Georgia just offered him yesterday. I don't know if Michigan's involved, but Ari, to me, this is an interesting dynamic because we know that Ohio State, the one area where maybe they're looking to, well, a lot of areas, but upgrade their recruiting is the offensive line. 
these are good players. I mean, no one's sneezing at blue chip four stars, but they're not top 100 guys. They're not five stars. So if you're Ohio State, like, is this a situation where, Ari, they, they, <laughs> they might get in trouble for slow playing? You okay there, Chief? For yeah, slow, just, uh, slow, pay, slow playing two local kids who might not sign. You know, well, that's just an interesting dynamic. That's the exact spot that I thought Michigan should have been attacking harder for the last 10 years. You know, it's like if you can't go in and get the guys that Ohio State wants out of Ohio, there's still a hell of a lot of players in Ohio that will go and be all Big Ten players. And I can't tell you how many times coaches have gotten up into news conferences during my time on the Ohio State beat complaining about, I don't know how this guy's at Wisconsin or this guy's there or this guy's there. And it's like Michigan has done a very good job in the past of analyzing that talent and getting that talent, and especially considering the fact that Ohio State has become more and more national every year which means they're taking less and less players out of their own state, which means in turn, there's more players to go around. So like, I don't know the deal on the Cleveland Heights kids and the twins, but if he's a top 400 player in Ohio state's, you know, they've offered around with five offered, star. But, yeah, yeah. But if they're like, put them number four on the board and they're after four or five star prospects in Florida and Texas, I'm Michigan. I go all in and maybe I win that battle now, you know? And, you know, I, I, I'm all on board on that. It's like how many good players have left Ohio for Kentucky because Michigan wasn't in Ohio. And it's like part of the reason why Kentucky is better in the SEC this year is because they have an Ohio roster. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and they're winning SEC games. Yeah. 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 And I think we're starting to see Michigan move into that space a little bit more. Um, Luke Hamilton was an Ohio kid, offensive lineman, four-star offensive lineman in the 24 class. One of those who committed to Michigan mm -hmm. after the Ohio State game. Uh, they, they got a, a player named Ted Hammond um, out of Ohio for the 24 class. So, yeah, you know, players right in that range, like top 200, top 300, not top 100, but close. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that's kind of where Michigan wants to go. I, and I think the more that, players like that you get – the more likely you will be to get a five star when he comes, because right. you know what, St. Ed's is going to have another five star prospect. Yeah, Cleveland Heights is going to have five star prospects. I mean, it's not like it's like building the relationship, being a constant fixture in those hallways, getting former teammates, and you know, a five star kid doesn't care what the kid was rated or the circumstances of of a former teammate. If he if he has a relationship with that person and he's at Michigan, he might look at Michigan uh, a little bit harder than he would have before, and over time you become more and more of a player in that state. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a great point. I think that's another thing that's shifted a little with Michigan is, you know, there was a time when if Michigan was going to reach on somebody, they would reach for a kid from some place that they weren't going to go back to again. And it's like, why are you reaching for him? If you want to reach, you know, reach for a kid from Michigan or a kid from Ohio state where, you know, maybe yeah. he'll turn into a great player and maybe it's a good role with the staff, the but you're going to go back there and it can be the start of something. I think we've seen Michigan do that a little more. And when we did the Ohio recruiting confidential, Mitch, I don't remember. Was I a part of that one or not? I can't No, you were remember. not. It was Bill Landis. But oh, then I read two straight it. episodes. We've talked about Bill Landis. <laughs> he's just uh, he's the Four man one the out for Bill. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of Michigan should be here more in that story, if I recall. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And. and I love the Kentucky point. It's not that simple, and, and Ari's written about it. But you know, I, I wonder how many SEC fans have really thought about like the. It's not the only reason, but like Kentucky football is good because Michigan decided not to recruit Ohio as much, or whether they decided or didn't recruit as successful, and maybe Kentucky and, and and Mark Stoops and that staff would say, and Vince Merrill would say, well, it didn't matter. You know, maybe they don't recruit Ohio as well because of us, and we beat them out mm -hmm. on kids. Who knows the the details? But I just the love lead that of my story was that Vince Merrow, the lead recruiting yeah. analyst or recruiting staffer Tight at coach, Kentucky, yeah. does a fist pump every time Ohio State takes an out of state prospect <laughs> in their class. He and knows also, exactly what the score is. Yeah. He also does a fist pump every time there's a Jim Harbaugh NFL rumor that comes out because he, yeah. he did one on Twitter. It's funny, though, because Penn State came in to Ohio and got Drew Aller, right? Mm -hmm. And he might be a first round draft pick one day. We'll see. But who did Michigan sign uh, at the quarterback position in their 2022 class? Uh, Jaden. Jaden Denigal and yeah. Alex Orgy. Alex Orgy. Yeah. They took, and so, you know they yeah. might, and maybe one of those guys will turn out to be great. I'm not trying to disparage them, but Michigan, if Penn State can do it, Michigan can do it. Probably how, even better than than Penn State can because they're closer. How is uh? W what's the thought on Alex Orgy there? I think the thought was that he was going to be a work in progress. Committed um, to Virginia Tech first. Yeah, he was committed yeah. to Virginia Tech. Um, three star quarterback out of Texas. 
had a ton of tools, big arm, um, a guy who can run the ball. We saw him come in in some wildcat packages last year. I think the thought was like, Hey, let's take this guy and just see what we can do with him. Um, you know, it, would I be surprised if he ends up as uh, the starting quarterback at Michigan? Probably I, I would be, but you know, you never know. I think the thought was just like, let's, let's get this guy in here and see what he can do. And um, it, maybe is we'll this, find something. Is this kid related to the kid from uh, Vanderbilt? Mitch? Yeah. Why do you think I asked about him? Both of it's oh, interesting okay. because he had two, his two older brothers signed with Vanderbilt. His oldest brother, Alston was one of the highest recruits in school history and didn't do much. His younger brother, Anthony, um, has been great, was all SEC, and he's in the combine right now. Um, so very, obviously, it's just interesting, you had two, two linebackers and then a quarterback there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, he was actually at the combine today. So You know what's interesting? What's interesting? The announcers stole your joke that you texted from. Remember yeah, when I know. one of the Orgy brothers blocked a punter, scored a touchdown. Pick six or scored a touchdown he said there was an orgy in the in the end zone, end zone. yes that was uh and mitch was pissed because that was his joke yes we well, should have trademarked that well mitch. yeah i was the sideline yeah. reporter for <laughs> vanderbilt for, for seven years and i was gonna come like if i could would i get fired if i said like if he sacked someone like there's an orgy in the backfield like i don't know is that allowed i don't know honestly speaking uh if this kid ever becomes a starting quarterback <laughs> at michigan you have a lot of material there austin I mean, I think uh, I think Robert Griffin the yes. third has uh, fairly thoroughly uh, explored. Is he, is <laughs> explored he the one the that's yeah, the one that said it? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but earlier in the year, mm-hmm. and I think it was the Hawaii game, the first game, of the year, week zero. Uh, yeah, we bet on Anf- it. Yeah, Anthony or you bet on it. Anthony or <laughs> bet on scored it. a touchdown. Um, yeah, that was the game. Yeah, that was the game. So, um, dude, Vandy won by like seventy in that game, didn't they? Just like smack them. Yeah, it was like dude. I, six, honestly, sometimes I watch Vanderbilt and I'm like, this team has what it takes to win a national title. You you say that? <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> what sport I'm just are we talking? Mitch happy. Yeah, what sport are we talking about? All right. Um, some interesting things at Clemson. Another pro. We are hitting all of Ari's buttons here. We're Michigan, Ohio State, Clemson. Ari, I don't know if you noticed earlier today, Clemson. Ari, why why is Clemson my button? Well, no, because you, you've You're got perpetuating the fan stereotypes. You've got thoughts on Clemson. You have. Hot. I have thoughts yeah. on everything. You I have, have thoughts yeah. on your hat right now. <laughs> yes. Um, got a commitment from a running back, um, David Ezio, Ezio Mume, four-star from Kennesaw, Georgia, number 335. The interesting thing about the running back position at Clemson, the two running backs they signed in 2023 were the two lowest players, lowest rated players mm-hmm. in their class, 950, number 950, Jarvis Green, and number 1,079, Jamarius Haynes. In 2022, they signed one running back, Keith Adams from Utah, talking about the Clemson, Utah to Clemson pipeline, number 1,462. So that followed up the 21 class with five-star Will Shipley and number 188, Phil Maffa. So... C.J. Spiller's the running back coach now. It's kind of come under, I know, the, from Clemson fans, and we don't want to – it's not all rankings, but clearly, um, you know, it's early in the process, so this kid's a four-star, could could climb, but this was probably a, a good get. But, Ari, I'm just shocked that they have not done better at the running back position after signing two top 100 guys three years ago. It would be so Clemson if one of the kids that ranks outside of the top 900 turns out to be a Heisman Trophy finalist, though. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. It's like, with Clemson – the fact that they've been able to turn so many of those types of players into first round draft picks during the Dabo Sweeney era makes you think like, well, they get the benefit of the doubt. You know, like if other programs sign that same exact player, the uh, discussion point around that commitment might be different. But for Clemson, they get the benefit of the doubt. Now, the question I have for you guys is, is when does that stop? You know, at a certain point, you know, the, What's that from Wolf of Wall Street? The chickens are going to come home to roost. And, you know, it's. You want to be a national championship contender every year and you want to beat Alabama and Georgia. You're not going to get there by continually signing running backs or any other position outside of the top 500 because eventually you're not going to outdevelop those guys, especially considering the fact that they have so many top 100 players that they don't even have to develop anymore. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy, but you get 15 to 17 top 100 guys in a single class four years in a row. Uh, you know, anybody could coach that team. So, you know. Yeah, I'd say if there's one position, the though, that yeah, if, you're gonna, if you're going to – if there's one position where you're, you're recruiting with subpar according to the rankings, 
I'd probably take it at running back because you can not that anyone can do it, but if you got a good offensive line, good quarterback, good skill guys, you you can find a running back who can do some good things. But mm-hmm. uh, just just interesting. Um, all right, Austin, it's time to talk a little Kansas State recruiting. Let's do it. So they signed your beloved alma mater signed the number thirty two class in twenty twenty three, up from number sixty three. Is the first top forty class in two th- since two thousand and eight. Now we know their history of relying on junior college guys. Just just as a guy that's familiar with the program, what's realistic for Kansas State recruiting? Should it be a top thirty five class or top fifty development type type classes? I think top maybe say the top ten. Say, say top. It, top ten. Put some pressure on. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Chris Kleiman would love that. No, I think top. I think top forty is is realistic for for Kansas State. You know, when I talk to Chris Kleiman um, before the season, you know, just about what his what his plan was. Um, you know, they they are always going to be a you know a developmental program, um, but there's actually you know there's been a kind of under the radar run of some good high school players in Kansas. Um, Dylan Edwards, who they had yeah, temporarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the quarterback, his name is escaping me, but. Um, yeah, and so you know they they've actually they have a I think a little better talent base there than they used to, um, and then Texas has always been really good for for them. They've been able to go into Texas and get those players who may not be going um, to Texas or Texas A and M. You know the the junior college recruiting was always a really big part of it for Kansas State, and then obviously with the portal, that's all really changed. Uh, so they're going to have to kind of figure out a little bit different way to do it. But um, were you a JUCO transfer, or did you go straight from high school to Kansas State? No, man, I was uh, I was a blue chip uh, blue chip recruit straight out of Clay Center, Kansas. Nice. All right. Well, hey, you know, you say Big Twelve champion Kansas State with your chest, though. I mean, That's, come on, let's, let's yeah. show some respect. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was in school when they won the the two thousand three Big Twelve championship when they beat Oklahoma. That was like the high point of my life as a sports fan, probably up to that point. Was there a quarterback, L. Roberson? L. Roberson, yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, they had some fun teams to watch. I love oh, that was, those teams. Yeah, that offense was, I mean, Bill Snyder and a, uh, a mobile quarterback was like magic. And Darren Sproles. And Darren Sproles, yeah. Um, all five foot seven of him. All right, I've got two trivia questions. Let's go with the Michigan one I cannot first. believe it's been 20 years since that team existed. God, we're getting old. I didn't, I hadn't, until you said that, I had not processed that thought. So <laughs> thank you for uh, bringing me a little uh, closer to my well, own mortality. You, you guys yeah. are, you guys think you're old. During this podcast, my daughter just texted me and said, I have to order my graduation regalia now. It's so sad and terrible. And this is college graduation, not uh, high school. So what's that, what's that word mean? Regalia? Is that like I, a pasta? Like, uh, just shit like graduation attire, photo announcements, thank you notes, return address labels, envelope seals, all that stuff. What so, was that word? It's a regalia, isn't it? Is that only graduation related or is that know. word mean like I'm just reading I'm gonna, Joey's texts. I've never heard that word before. In my I've life. heard the word. I think it's just like stuff like it's it's like stuff you celebrate type regalia. Uh, look it up. The emblems or insig- the emblems or insignia of royalty, especially the crown, scepter and the other ornament used at the coronation. So maybe that's just the clothing cap and gown. worn. Yeah, I think I think that means cap and gown. But your daughter is really smart, so she uses big words. Yeah, well, just, the, and just since the, you're using all these big words, I'm going to take it to disrespect. Yeah, shut your mouth and help me with the sale. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So this is I think this is a fun one for everyone. I mean, I know the answers. I looked it up, but Ari, you should get in on this too. Rank since 2010. Rank Michigan's quarterback signees in order. Since 2010. Um, yes. Like, okay, who's the, who's the highest rated Michigan sign, quarterback signing since 2010? J.J. McCarthy. J.J., yeah. Nope. Well, are, are we talking... Okay, clarification. In order. Are we talking high school or yes. are we talking... Yes. Oh, um, Ryan Mallett? Yes. Good call. Ryan okay. Mallett, the, they signed three five stars. Ryan Mallett is the most highly rated of them. Ryan Mallett. And you then said JJ. since 2010. Yeah, when was Mallett? Oh, I'm such an idiot. Ryan Mallett's in 07, I think. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Oh, uh, okay. No, but that's, Thank you are correct because my Kansas State question is about 2010. Michigan's is in the um, 
Two more seven modern, modern, modern era. era. Okay. I'm sorry, modern era. So Ryan Mallett, 2007, is number one. Then McCarthy. Nope, right? McCarthy's th- third. Then it has to be Chad Henney. Yes, Chad Henney is third. So those are the three five stars. I didn't know if you were including Shea Patterson in there as a no, no. five star who transferred in. Right, transfer in. So there are six more guys. I mean, they sign more than that, but all ranked among the top 125 nationally. So some very high four stars. I know another one. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna blow your uh, blow your cover here, though. So Austin, if you want to take it's, a guess, this is for I both you guys. Are uh, oh, we doing it as a tag team? Yeah, tag team here. Team effort. Uh, um, Tate Forcier was he on the list? Tate is number eight. Okay. Uh, what about uh, Shane? Yes, you're close. You got the first name. Oh, Shane Morris. Yes. Shane Morris. Yes. He's number four. He's the highest rated four star, number seventy one in two thousand thirteen. And then who's that kid that played it in at Illinois at the end of his he's, career? He's next. Oh. Uh, he was pretty highly ranked too. Brandon Peters. Yes. Yeah. Number uh, sixty one. So actually, he okay, was. Okay. How many more? Oh, and I was on the. Uh, I think I was on the uh, when I did the playoff thing, the mock playoff committee. Yeah. Devin Gardner was a part of that. He's, yes. he's in there, right? Yeah, number yeah. six, uh, Devin, 2010, yeah. number 69. Okay, so you got three more to go. Um, what was... Uh, I think I'm cast here, guys. I don't know anyone else. See, my, I I um, am embarrassed to say, like, my pre... The time on before I came on the Michigan beat, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy. What was Denard as a, as a recruit? He's number 10. He was listed as an athlete, but I put mm-hmm. him down because he played quarterback. Um, yeah. So, okay. Oh, oh uh... One of them signed, I believe, during your tenure, Austin. Um, the McCaffrey kid, the other yeah. McCaffrey. Oh yeah, Dylan McCaffrey. Yes. Yeah, Dylan, no, Dylan four, star. four star. Yeah. And the other one signed in two thousand and two. I remember the name, but two thousand and two. No idea. Matt I'm, Gutierrez. I'm not, never heard of that human being in my entire life. Okay, well, you have You know who we who we did not mention on this list? Uh, Big Joe Milton. Oh yeah, what he, was he? Is he a, he was he like a he was a four star, right? Uh, borderline th- three star, four star. Okay. Yeah. All right, this one top ten Kansas State high school recruits <laughs> since two thousand and ten. Couldn't name one. <laughs> but here's the good thing. luck. May the force may the may the Tate four CA be with you. <laughs> Not nine. Um, nine of their top ten were before two thousand and ten. Oh wait, I wrote a story about one of them. Right. The quarterback. Like, the quarterback. What's his name? Jake Rubley. Jake Rubley, yeah. He's number oh. two. Hmm. Okay. okay. That's so, it. That's Austin, my can you, you even want to try this? or If we went like 2000 to 2010, I'd, I was going to say Josh Freeman, but Josh Freeman yeah, he was, was yeah, earlier. He was, yeah, too early. So. Um, so, wait, did you ask since the beginning of time? Or no, since I said 2010. 2010. Hmm. I'm trying to think of like. Oh, dude, they just got a kid from the opening last year. Yeah, number one. Avery Johnson. Yeah. Hey, that's the quarterback I was trying to yeah. get. Yeah, yeah. Avery So their top two are quarterbacks, and they're both on the roster right now. Um, Ari, I don't think you would get any of the other ones. They're not really household names. A couple no, of guys. Yeah, I, I got the quarterbacks that yeah. we covered, but I, I'm done. I don't know anything else. Hmm. I was just going to start throwing out some of their best players' uh, names. Uh, uh, uh Daniel, they had a running back who was rated pretty high. Daniel, uh, Tom, Daniel Thomas. Thomas, but yeah, I'll just fire him off. Asa Newsom, athlete. Well, it's no, I, part of the reason I want to bring this up too is like f- one, two, three, four, five of the ten are in this class. So I wouldn't, you know, unless you follow. Uh, Asa Newsom, it? athlete, two thousand twenty-three. Jordan Allen, edge, two thousand twenty-three. Donovan McIntosh, cornerback, two thousand twenty-three. Demarcus Robinson, I remember that running back, 2010. He was a good player, I think, right? Um, Tanner Wood, defensive end, 2013. Joe Jackson, running back, 2023. Nick Ramirez, inside linebacker, 2013. And Jalen Clem, offensive tackle, 2022. So, there you have it. Ari? If you told me to do the Arizona one, I don't think I could do it. I think I did it on one podcast. Did we do it? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you got... It, yeah, you got one guy. I mean, you got a couple of the obvious ones. I forgot who they were, and then you pulled one of them out, and, but maybe only got like four of the ten. Um, yeah, well, that was a fun show, Austin. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, that was fun.
Thanks for um, you seem surprised. You seem surprised. Like, I, yeah, well, that I actually was. was un- <laughs> I was unsure going in, but it yeah. exceeded my expectations. Were you, what were you afraid of? That I was just going to like be a hothead and just like <laughs> ramble the whole no, time? Uh, you know, you get the, the Michigan and the Ohio State people in the same room, and virtually yeah. it can get a little spicy, but no. Yeah, is, no, I, good. I'm very relaxed and uh, <laughs> going to go take a nice warm shower now and clean my pores and get to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, uh, your por- are your pores dirty? No, actually, I. Uh, Went and got a facial with my wife on Sunday for the first time. Laugh. I laughed when she said she got me one. It was for Valentine's Day. It was at a spa I'm here. Laughing. And, dude, it was majestic. Have you guys ever, have you had one, Austin? No. I have not, no. You lay on a chair, you take your shirt off, and you lay back, <laughs> and somebody rubs your head and your face with all these ointments and creams in your chest and your shoulders, and they, like, exfoliate your skin, and it's like, my skin is so soft. So as a result of that, they said I had, by the way, I don't have all the greatest physical gifts. You know, there's some things I got to work on. Top 5% skin. Top, you know, really? She said I had great skin because I don't ever get pimples or, but I what also. What do you expect her to say? It's her business. She wants you to come back. No, but I have, I have impeccable skin. Don't okay. try. I mean, if, if she really wanted you to come back, she might have said you had really bad skin. That's a good point. That's yeah, very, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. But she made it clear to me because I don't have a moisturizing routine. Do you guys? No. no. You don't moisturize your face? No. Like, do anything no. with your face before? No. Yeah, I'm 35 and I haven't yet, but she said if you want to keep this skin, that you should get, you know, that, 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 every that's night trying before to you go to the shower. Right there, I didn't yeah. buy it from her, so okay. she, I'm not going to spend the money there, but she said that everybody should probably have a, uh, a routine with their skin before they go to bed at night or after they get out of the shower. So I'm going to go take a shower and I'm doing, you know, skin routine. You know, if I'm going to look pretty on camera, you know, I got to do something about the face. <laughs> if I'm going to look right. as handsome as you, Austin. I don't okay. think I'm com- right. I'm not uh, completely sold, uh, but I'm I'm intrigued. I'll, OK, well, Mitch I'll had to bail thought. for for whatever reason. He just got up and left. So <laughs> that's a good way to to wrap up the show. Austin, thank you so much for uh, joining us this week. It was a pleasure talking to you about this stuff and excited to see how Michigan's class plays out for the listeners. Maybe if you're not a Michigan fan, you still learned something today. We hope you did. Next week, we'll have a more comprehensive show. Appreciate you guys. We will catch you next Wednesday.